good evening and uh, welcome to what is the uh, the first of our 2022 evening lectures online and um, my name is uh, Patrick I am a student and follower of Jesus of Nazareth and I have a long-standing love for God and for his word I also enjoy um, archaeology and artifacts, particularly those that relate in one way or another to the, uh, the biblical narrative. And that's what sort of brings everything together for what we're going to do uh, this evening. For more years than I can remember, oh, more years certainly than anyone will care to know, I've been teaching with the British Bible School here in the uh, in the UK, and we're all about teaching and training in the Word of God for any who care to listen. So, if you'd like to know more about what we do, let me encourage you to uh, to follow us on social media. Probably most of you here are already doing that, which is how you've got to hear of uh, of what's going on this evening. Uh, sign up on our website to keep up to date with goings on and. Uh, see ways in which we might be of service so yes welcome to um welcome to uh um this i'm just reading some of the the, the chat messages down here and uh, it is more than okay that you are in the stream absolutely yes indeed welcome to this the first of our evening lectures online we're planning to continue running these once every couple of months on a variety of subjects and we're Delighted to have you uh, with, um, uh, have each one of you with us uh, here this evening, wherever you might be. So we're planning tonight to take something of an epic journey and engage ourselves in a story of archaeological discoveries, which taken together provide some of the most compelling historical evidence bearing witness to a recorded biblical event. We're going to be traveling back in time many centuries to uh, one of the principal cities of the ancient kingdom of Judah at the eastern end of the, uh, the Mediterranean Sea. We'll be heading even further east to the capital city of the mighty Assyrian Empire, once ruled over by such infamous rulers as Tiglath Pileser the Terrible, well, he was generally known as Tiglath Pileser III, but um, uh, the appellation fits, I think, and the, the cruel but capable king of uh, uh, King Sennacherib. More about him uh, a little bit later. We'll make a hasty dash forward in time, crossing continents to the city of London, in which we will marvel at some significant and scintillatingly sensational artifacts which have come to reside in the British Museum. But let me uh, go ahead here and share my screen so that you can hopefully all see that on uh, your screen. So that's the general sort of idea. There we go. And uh, hopefully that will, um, uh, yeah, hopefully that will enable you to see uh what's going on there and yep one or two others have joined us well I'll keep on coming in we've got plenty of plenty of room don't we so the plan is to open up things at the end of our talk and um i think i can guarantee that we'll be absolutely no more than an hour I think I can guarantee that. So yeah, well, the plan is to open up things at the end of our talk for any questions you might have, but if you choose, you can use the chat window. I'll try to remember to keep an eye on it as we uh, go along. But um, yes, here we are. And let's begin by very slightly familiarizing ourselves with the uh, ancient city of Lachish. We'll begin with a very ancient road sign well we'll come back to that a little bit later so the um the city of Lachish was once considered to be one of the most important cities of Judah perhaps second only to Jerusalem 
and we're first introduced to Lachish in the Old Testament book of Joshua during Israel's conquest of the land of Canaan. Moses had led the Israelites out of Egypt, but now under the leadership of Joshua, God is giving the land into their hands. Well, the text there in the book of Joshua reads that Joshua and all Israel with him passed on from Libna to Lachish and lay siege to it and fought against it. And the Lord gave Lachish into the hand of Israel, and he captured it on the second day and struck it with the edge of the sword. And every person in it, just as he had done to Libna. So from this point onwards, certainly throughout the evening, well, for most of this evening anyway, Lachish will belong to Israel. Well, we're going to need to take ourselves back to the end of the 8th century BC, and uh, the kingdom of Israel had long been divided following the reign of Solomon. He was, you may recall, the son uh, of King David. And the northern kingdom had been essentially destroyed by the Assyrians under the reign of Shalmaneser V, although Sargon II, his um, successor, claims to have been responsible, but, um, well, you can take that as you will. The year was 722 or thereabouts B.C. Now, we need to fast forward in time a few years and uh, further to the south, and following the death of the Assyrian king, Sargon II, who may or may not have been the son of Tiglath-Pileser III, who, apart from being a rather nasty chap, is also the first Assyrian king mentioned in the Bible. Well, as we were saying, following the death of Sargon II, Judah rebelled and sought an alliance with Egypt. And uh, there we should have a, there we go, we've got the sign there for Egypt. Now, we will say that this was a rather foolish thing to do, and it was also completely contrary to the advice given by God through the prophet Isaiah. And needless to say, it didn't really impress the Assyrians, who um, um, became rather, let's say, peeved by the whole business. And so some 20 years following the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel, Sennacherib, the son of Sargon, invaded Judah. Sennacherib is generally considered to have been a very capable king, although uh, also terribly cruel, um, although that really does seem pretty much par for the course when it comes to kings of Assyria. But I can't really think of any one, well, maybe with the possible exception of uh, Asher and Nazareth, but I can't really think of any one that I would particularly like to invite round for afternoon tea. Now, it might be useful to have a slightly larger map, so let's cue the slightly larger map. There we go. In the, um, in the process of his invasion of Judah, Sennacherib destroyed many of Judah's fortified cities, including the city of Lachish, and there it is, just down the road from Jerusalem. But that's not the whole story. His intention was to destroy the southern kingdom of Judah, and so on the very top of his hit list was Jerusalem. And here, is a probably slightly less than authentic copy of Sennacherib's 
hit list. But that's something that God would not allow him to do. He would not allow Sennacherib to take the city of Jerusalem. It was not going to fall, at least certainly not at this time. We need now, having familiar, familiarized ourselves at least slightly with uh, a little bit of the background history uh, to the fall of Lachish at the hand of the Assyrians, we need to take a journey across continents to the city of London. And here we are flying in, up oh, there we go, to the British Museum. Um, flying in from the south. Well, we need to come to the British Museum because we need to take a look at a rather special document which is housed there. We, um, we'd better land this thing, hadn't we? Get down on the ground and we'll uh, walk in through the front door. There we go. And we'll make our way up the stairs to room 55. There it is in front of us. And the rather special document in which we are at this time particularly interested is the, it's here in the middle of the picture. There we go. Let's, uh, there it is, that, um, that rather strange looking document there. It is the prism of Sennacherib, also known as the Taylor prism. Here's a close up shot of it. Well, there we go. And you get another one. I think that one was thrown in totally free. There we go. There's another one coming up. Here we go. That's what we want. So you can look a little bit closer. Now, I don't know whether any of you here this evening are particularly familiar with Akkadian uh, cuneiform script, but there it is for you. And I'm sure you'd like to read it. For I will say this: the Taylor prism was discovered in Nineveh in 1830 by Colonel Jeffrey Taylor. That's why it's called the Taylor Prism. Some just know it as the Prism of Sennacherib. The problem with that is that there are three virtually identical documents, um, one across the pond, another one in Jerusalem, and they all say pretty much the same thing. And um, they record the first eight military campaigns of King Sennacherib of Assyria. And during his third campaign, he attacked Judah and he was making his way towards the capital city, Jerusalem, following, as we've already suggested, his um, rather selective hit list. Well, let's read some of the text here, and we'll do so in English. Um, partly because in any other way we won't really understand, and I won't have a clue either. So uh, it reads as follows, at least the little bit that we're concerned about. And you may be familiar with even a phrase or two from this document. As to Hezekiah the Jew, remember these are the words of Sennacherib on his uh, prism there. As to Hezekiah the Jew, he did not submit to my yoke. I lay siege to 46 of his strong cities, walled forts, and to the countless small villages in their vicinity, and conquered them by means of well-stamped earth ramps and battering rams brought uh, thus near to the walls, combined with the attack by foot soldiers using mines, breaches, as well as sapper work. I drove out of them 200,150 people, young and old, male and female, horses, mules, donkeys, camels, big and small cattle beyond counting, and considered them booty. Himself, that is Hezekiah, I made a prisoner in Jerusalem, his royal residence, like a bird in a cage. Absolutely fascinating and also really rather revealing. Now, I hope you've um, memorized that state. Well, at least become familiar with some of the details 
of the siege. For example, you took well a good note, I'm sure, of the well-stamped earth ramps, the battering rams, the foot soldiers, and on and on. We'll come back to those a little bit later. But this really is a rather revealing statement. This is certainly not the outcome he would have wanted from his campaign, as we've already said and observed from his slightly unorthodox hit list, Jerusalem was at the very top of that list. However, rather than record defeat, Sennacherib knew well how to spin the truth and make it look like he didn't actually get beaten. He would undoubtedly have made a jolly good politician today. Had he been around, of course. Now, it might well also be interesting for us to compare the official Assyrian account with the even more official account of scripture. So firstly, we'll take note that the prophet Isaiah records that in the 14th year of King Hezekiah, Sennacherib, king of Assyria, came up against all the fortified cities of Judah and took them. Well, that correlates exactly with what uh, Sennacherib himself had said, does it not? And then if we turn to the second book of Chronicles, we'll read that Sennacherib, king of Assyria, who was besieging Lachish with all his forces, sent his servants to Jerusalem, to Hezekiah, king of Judah, and to all the people of Judah who were in Jerusalem, saying, Thus says Sennacherib, king of Assyria, on what are you trusting that you endure the siege in Jerusalem? Well, you get the idea that Sennacherib thought a great deal about himself, and indeed he did. But what about those in Jerusalem? What about the uh, inhabitants of Judah, the Judahites? Well, quite simply, they were not trusting in Sennacherib. They were trusting in Yahweh, the God of Israel. And though he allowed Judah to suffer terribly, after all, they deserved nothing less, but even though he allowed Judah to suffer terribly, including the destruction of cities such as Beth Shemesh and Lachish and uh, a good number of, other, of others too, God prevented Sennacherib from destroying Jerusalem. There's a rather splendid picture that the prophet Isaiah paints of, um, uh, of, 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 of the nation being essentially uh, subject to a flood, and the flood water comes higher and higher, to almost to the point of drowning Jerusalem, but not quite. Well, this didn't stop Sennacherib from continuing his propaganda campaign against the inhabitants of Judah, and so his servants said still more against the Lord God and against his servant Hezekiah, and he wrote letters to uh, cast contempt on the Lord, the God of Israel, and to speak against him, saying, like the gods of the nations of the lands who have not delivered their people from my hands, so the God of Hezekiah will not deliver his people from my hand. Well, of course, he was wrong. He may well have been king of Assyria and, of course, considered himself to be king of the world, but that still didn't make him correct. He was clearly wrong. And like so many, he completely underestimated the one whom he calls the God of Hezekiah, who, of course, is the God of all heaven and earth. And he answered Sennacherib by catastrophically destroying the Assyrian army outside of Jerusalem, so that we are told in one night, a hundred and eight 5,000 of the Assyrian soldiers died. 
the authorized version refer refers to them as dead corpses, not that I'm sure that there are any other kind, but um, I, I, I've often wondered whether one day the bodies will be discovered. Oh, wouldn't that be a joy? I mean, not that not that it's terribly joyful to discover dead bodies. That's not the point. But the uh, you know the the uh, the excitement that that would cause all these uh, many many years later. But we might well ask, what about the siege of Lachish, which turned out to be the final city to which Sennacherib successfully laid? siege. What else might we know of it besides the biblical account and the general report of Sennacherib on his prisons? Well, in order to discover more, we're going to do another little bit of time traveling, this time back nearly 170 years and be introduced to our good old friend, Sir Austin Henry Layard. Now I'm saying our good old friend because no doubt some of you have uh, encountered him before in one way or another, particularly if you were um, at a similar event that we held about a year ago in our little sort of virtual guided tour around the uh, the British Museum. Well, Austin Henry Layard was a, a British traveler, archaeologist, cuneiformist, art historian, draftsman, collector, author, and diplomatist, best known as the excavator of Nimrod. Um, I'm not terribly sure what he did in his spare time, but nevertheless, not to worry, um, he was a bit of a wandering diplomat with a particular interest in the ruins of Nimrod on the Tigris and the great mound of Kienik near Mosul. So Kayanik um, had already been partly and unsuccessfully excavated by a Frenchman by the name of Paul-Emile Botard uh -huh, uh, before he turned his attention to Corsabad, um, in which he uh, uh, was to discover the uh, remains of the capital city built by Sargon. More of that another time, I'm sure. But it was here at uh, Kayonik that uh, Layard had discovered Nineveh. He first excavated here from 1845 to 1847, and in 1847, Layard discovered a series of wall panels in what had been the palace of King Sennacherib in Nineveh. Incidentally, this is the palace that Sennacherib himself had described as being that which was without rival. He really was rather impressed at his, uh, at his feats, at his uh, uh, achievements. However, this, this series of wall panels discovered in what had been the palace of Sennacherib at Nineveh proved to be the first real significant archaeological confirmation of an actual biblical event. Well, apart from creation, perhaps. So here's the, um, here's the location of ancient Nineveh. You might have seen it earlier on this same map a few minutes ago. And uh, if we zoom in quite significantly, um, here's the plan of the Southwest Palace at Nineveh. Uh, notice these, um, uh, notice these uh, three staterooms. There we go. We've highlighted those for you. Each one connected by doorways flanked by human-headed winged creatures. Now, the location of, uh, of uh, this complex of staterooms suggests that they were of uh, particular importance. Uh, this would almost certainly have been the sort of place where he would have entertained foreign dignitaries, uh, and at least those that he allowed into his palace 
um, alive. And it's quite possible that this might have looked something like this. This is not specifically intended to be that uh, precise uh, group of rooms, but you get the idea of the painted wall panels, the human headed winged creatures and, and on. It was a really rather splendid affair. Back to our uh, floor plan and particularly highlighting there in the middle room 36 and um, let's see we'll put it there's a plan a detailed plan of room 36 and you can tell from its location that it was in a particularly significant this was sort of the inner room of this series of state rooms implying that it was um, jolly important indeed and it is here where these wall panels were located we'll highlight on that there we go if you can see the the orange that's where the wall panels were located now wouldn't you like a look at them well of course we would and so in order to see the panels today we're going to re need to return to the british museum and go back downstairs to the ground floor and uh here they are uh, let's take a look at the uh take a look at the uh, the main ones from the front normally would come in from the uh, the other door down there on the right there we go now does this not look like the most exciting room that ever there was huh well i'm inclined to think so anyway i mean absolutely spectacular we really don't have time to do full justice to the magnitude of this monumental memorial nor indeed for me to indulge you with all of the personal delights of such a splendiferously sumptuous scene so um well, if you want to do all of those kind of things, then uh, maybe we should meet up in London sometime and do lunch. And I see that we have, well, Anne-Marie, good to see you there. I, there we go. It's well, I mean, maybe some others who have, uh, well, there are some others I can who have taken me up on that, uh, I was going to say challenge, that offer before. There we go. And uh, so, uh, yes, let's get together sometime and do lunch in London and we'll, uh, we'll, 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 well, we could spend a day in this room alone if you wanted, uh, but there's lots of other things to see, of course, throughout the museum. Now, what I want us to do here, I want to try to do something a little different. So um, hopefully you can see that now and we're going to sort of run through it um, I just put this together. It's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it gives something of an idea of the full length of the, the siege part of the scene. And um, uh, hopefully you get something of a feel for it. Uh, the, uh, the total length of panels in their original situation would have been um, about 88 feet or just uh, just under 27 meters in length. It really was a, a most impressive display. So let's kick this off here. And I want you to notice first of all, because we're, they'll go out of sight in a few seconds, they're at the bottom left, um, at the bottom left of the picture, these slingshot throwers. I don't know, what do you call them? Slingers? Throwers? Whatever they are, they are. So they're, so anyway, so we'll, we'll, we'll go through this and see if we can talk our way through it okay he's still able to hear hope so there we go good 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 so um notice there also we've got some archers oh i think if we listen very carefully we can actually maybe hear the battle underway there we go we've got some archers there and um and then some spearmen there these are some of the infantry footmen that uh, sennacherib spoke of there with their spears and their shields and uh, notice the bumpy terrain there. Let's just pause that momentarily if we can. Notice that sort of bumpy terrain. You can just see it going out of shot on the left. And that indicates the, uh, the, 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 the terrain the, that we are here in the sort of lower part of the, the, the foothills of, uh, of Judea, as opposed to the more flat 
area uh, throughout much of the Assyrian uh, Empire. So notice uh, as we go along here, you can see these um, these earthen uh, siege ramps that have been built and uh, the, there's some arches there. And you'll also notice, we'll look at closer detail in a minute, some of the um, uh, some of the, the siege engines, the battering rams that are brought up against the walls. We can now see um, we can now see uh, some of the, uh, the 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 exiles, the Judahites being taken off into exile. Really, rather tragic scene as they become uh, Judean refugees. We've got a couple of chaps here being flayed alive. Um, certainly not a good way to end. A, uh, a, a Saturday evening. So, um, and then we've got a fella coming up here from the right. Um, he's not being given a shave. Okay. Thank you uh, very much indeed. Here we go, the slingshot throwers and the archers uh, there that we saw at the very beginning of the, uh, the scene earlier. Again, you'll see that bumpy terrain there. We'll say a little more of the terrain a little moment uh, or so. Here we um, have the siege ramps. You can hopefully see those now. They're covered in logs. And this was in order to provide sort of a, uh, a, a wooden... Uh, a wooden surface to the uh, the ramps which enable these wheeled war machines these wheeled battering rams enable them to um, to uh, um, make good progress along the uh, uh, these ramps that were built right up against the uh, uh, city wall you might be asking why didn't I simply go in through the front door well we'll say something about that in a moment or two notice here the uh, Judahite defenders. There we go, the, the Judeans there defending the city there. They're shooting down arrows. And uh, notice the, the falling bits of masonry. Um, so I suppose, you know, when you get terribly desperate, you start taking the walls apart and, um, and throw them down upon your attackers. Uh, and you'll you'll see also the 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 arrows that are that are flaming the flaming arrows they are being also shot down upon the attacking Assyrians. Now I put this one in here. It's not a part of my original series. But I don't know if you can see in the very uh, middle near the top. There's a couple of wheels. Uh, uh, if you could the middle of the picture near the top, couple of wheels. These are parts of chariots. And it would seem that the inhabitants of Lachish had realized that the chariots were no longer of any use to them. So um, they set them on fire and threw them over the walls as well. I suppose if you can't find any large cows, burning chariots will do instead. OK, and they're hurled down onto the, uh, the Assyrian uh, attackers down below. Well, here we've got a, 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 a um, we got some, yeah, some more of the, because uh, we see a bit of a close up one there. And if you can recognize anybody there, but well, they've long since gone, of course. Um, we've seen the, uh, let's see, what else have we got? Here's a close up of some of the archers. Uh, they're um, advancing upon the city. Uh, they're on the sea on the siege ramps along with these battering rams. And here's a close up of one of the battering rams uh, that uh, that are being brought against. It's sort of like an early tank, isn't it? Uh, but um, the fellow at the front, you can see this rather large soup ladle um, affair. Uh, it's not actually a soup ladle, surprisingly. This is a um, uh, this is actually uh, a, a ladle full of water, we presume, in order to extinguish the burning arrows uh, to put out the fire. And, um, well, it has been observed that, uh, of course, because this is uh, many, many centuries ago before uh, the invention of gravity by Sir Isaac Newton in Cambridge, um, the water is falling at a 45 degree angle. Either that or it's simply the way in which the Assyrians portrayed these things. Uh, what else can we, well, there's lots of little bits and bobs that um, uh, I don't know if you saw earlier. Well, we've got lots of people who uh, who aren't going to see tomorrow here. Here are some of the uh, exiles being uh, taken away into captivity. Um, 
and let's see what else there we go we got a uh we, we, we we've, we've, we've got a, a family scene there the mothers with their children I mean, it's really very tragic isn't it and we've perhaps seen scenes similar to this uh on our television screens uh of people fleeing war zones in order to be uh, uh in order to find some kind of um some kind of refuge uh, somewhere or other. Uh, what else have we all oh, here? We've got uh, looks like some leaders being impaled, uh, kind of a little like some forms of crucifixion um, with which we may be uh, familiar. But again, not a terribly nice way to end your Saturday evening. Um, oh, and here's those fellas being flayed alive along with some other exiles. And that certainly isn't a nice way to go. Here's the fella. Oh, there's a close up of them. I'm sorry if you're eating, um, but uh, if you are, close your eyes for the next couple of moments and I'll tell you when to open them again. Um, here's the fella not being given a shave. Um, he's having uh, his head toppled and uh, really not very nice people, are they? Notice the terrain in the background. You can open your eyes now. You can see the vineyards, very typical of this part of the world, not of Nineveh, not of Assyria, where these panels are found, but of Judah, uh, where this scene is, uh, uh, is depicting and uh, we move along a little bit further we go we turn around on the wall to our right there is Sennacherib himself there we go and that's probably the origin of the phrase nice legs shame about the face in all likelihood the uh, face of Sennacherib was removed many many years ago by Babylonians maybe in 612 BC quite likely when the palace was destroyed by them but um, now you've noticed there's a little bit more cuneiform text, okay? And some of you who've already learned this will know exactly what it says. There's a close up of the, of the first line. And as you can see very clearly, it reads Sennacherib, king of the world, king of the land of Assyria. Well, I suppose you would be if you were king of the world. And um, gosh, I suppose that would make him king of the united well maybe not anyway moving on then looking at the very bottom or line three here at the very end is the word um, line three that should be line four shouldn't it we've got uh, uh lakish that's how we know exactly where it is and just around the corner again we've got a picture of the assyrian camp lots of things going on there including cooking and of course the obligatory religious offerings and uh, this camp is referred to also within the pages of scripture if we were to turn around go to the other end of the room we'd find a very interesting display case there in the uh, the museum including some arrowheads now remember these are the, the these were excavated at Lachish and so well, you might very well have seen these in the pictures on the panels. Uh, and also we've got some uh, sling stones. Um, again, you might have seen these very ones in the pictures on the panels. These also excavated um, at Lachish and probably very similar to the one that met Goliath just before he met his uh, uh, his terminal breath so um oh and uh, if we popped upstairs where we were earlier they have on display for us an assyrian helmet again maybe one of those that we saw earlier in the pictures now what i'd like you to do we've got a few moments left here i think we're doing okay hope everybody's still sitting comfortable incidentally i didn't mention the um the availability of uh, refreshments just go into the kitchen wherever you are and uh, help yourself to what you like of course you've probably been doing that haven't you for some of you here it's still very early in the day i don't know maybe you're making your way through a bowl of cut and crunch that's what i'd be doing if i was across the pond but nevertheless um i want you to cast your mind back to what you were doing on the 20th of june 
2014. There we go. Nearly eight years ago on the 20th of June. Do you remember what you were doing? Well, I most certainly do, because it was for me one of the most exciting days of my life. I had spent a month um, uh, as uh, as also, there we go, Holly's with us here tonight. Um, remember this well, I'm sure. I'd spent a month uh, in the valley, uh, the Sorek Valley uh, at uh, Tel Beth Shemesh on an archaeological dig. And there we go. Every day we, um, uh, we were working from, what was it, five o'clock in the morning till about one in the afternoon on site, looking across the Sorek Valley to Timna, to the, 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 the the birthplace of Samson and where all of his life activities have happened so many years before we digress and we shouldn't do that. But um, it was, I think, the first weekend that we were there. We took a trip south and our first stop was Tel Lachish. Well, I'll tell you what, I was like a little boy at Christmas. Um, at least a little boy at Christmas, um, getting lots of presents. Um, having visited the wall panels that we've just seen at the British Museum so many, many, many times before, I was now standing in the actual spot where it had all happened. And there we go. That's the sign pointing to where we were. Well, I didn't take this picture, um, needless to say, but here is an aerial view of Tel Lachish. And um, uh, well, there's lots of details we could point out. We're not going to do so right now, other than to say, if you take a look at the right hand side of the mound, incidentally, a tell is essentially a mound built up over centuries of civilization. We'll maybe say something about that process on another one of these Saturday evening events, perhaps. But look at the right hand side of the mound and you'll see there. Um, a rather uh, extensive uh, area that has been excavated. Let's, so oh, there it is. I forgot I'd highlighted it. Well, if we come and have a look from a slightly different angle, there we go again. You can see it at the front of the picture here. Uh, that is uh, the, uh, at the very front is the, uh, the Iron Age gatehouse. Now, I'll point out as well in the foreground over to the left uh, is where was discovered a late Bronze Age Canaanite temple from the uh, years before uh, Israel occupied uh, the uh, the site. And uh, there's a temple there known as the Foss Temple, which basically means the, the temple in the ditch. And uh, there's quite a number of artifacts from it on display in the British Museum, but all of those things predate um, the occupancy by Israel. Well, Tel Lachish has been excavated on quite a number of occasions since 1932, and it's produced some very significant discoveries, including evidence of Hezekiah's campaigns against idolatry. Um, there was fairly recently discovered uh, near the, the uh, gatehouse, there was sort of a, there was a holy site, a little bit like a holy of holies. And remember, we're not in Jerusalem. And in order, what seems to have been in order to show its desecration, um, they'd built a loo in the middle of it. That is during the time of Hezekiah. Um, that certainly made it clear that, that nothing more religious was going to go on there. And I suppose religious things don't generally go on uh, in the... Uh, uh, in the Kazi. So uh, there's a sketch here of what uh, the city might well have looked like uh, prior to the Assyrian invasion. This sketch was drawn in uh, 1933 during the early Starkey excavations. Incidentally, Starkey went on to be murdered on our way back to uh, Jerusalem. Another story for another time. But in order to demonstrate uh, that Lachish was a very significant city in the days of Hezekiah. Uh, a number of stamped jar handles uh, 
have been discovered um, uh, in uh, Lachish and a lot of them elsewhere, but more uh, were discovered in Lachish than in any other uh, location in uh, Judah. These date from the late 8th, the 7th century BC, bearing the inscription uh, Lamelech, which means belonging to the king, and the king in question being none other than Hezekiah. Well, back again to that gatehouse. A couple of pictures of it. Here's an earlier one, and here's one um, whilst it uh, is under excavation back in June of 2014. And rather excitingly, long before I was there, but in 1935, there were a number of ostraca discovered. Now, ostraca or potsherds are just like what they say. I don't know if you can see my screen still, but I'm holding up here a piece of broken pot. And this here actually is from Lachish, um, discovered in 2014. There we go, during my day visit to the site. And I picked this up because of those that were discovered in 1935 in the gatehouse, the main gatehouse, in a burnt layer associated not with the destruction by the Assyrians, but by the slightly later destruction by the Babylonians. They're written in a Paleo-Hebrew script and they contain communications to a military commander based at Lachish. I think I've got it. There we go. There's a couple of, a picture of a couple of these letters written on potsherds, broken bits of pottery in black ink sent from the outposts of Lachish to the city commander leading up to the city's destruction in 5 86 BC. No doubt were they to have had WhatsApp or even email, they would have used some other means of communication, but apparently the servers were down at that time, probably due to some foreign interference. I don't know how it goes, but um, Jeremiah said, I don't know if I've got, did I put his quote? Yes, I did. He said that when they, so remember, this is not during the time of Hezekiah. This is roughly a um, hundred and hundred and what, 30 years or so later, 120 years later, um, when uh, the city had been uh, largely rebuilt and the Babylonians came back to destroy it. And uh, on that occasion, God did not stop them from going on to destroy the city of Jerusalem, but that's a whole lot of other different stories for a whole lot of other occasions. Jeremiah then, um, who's writing at that time, said that when the army of the king of Babylon, we're talking about Nebuchadnezzar, you might have come across the chat in your travels, when the army of the king of Babylon was fighting against Jerusalem and against all the cities of Judah that were left, Lachish and Azekah, the only fortified cities of Judah that remained. And uh, uh, we uh, frequently passed by Tel Azekah, the city that uh, Jeremiah speaks of there uh, those few years ago. Well, one of these letters, one of these letters here, these uh, Lachish letters, one of them reads, May uh, Yahweh cause my Lord to hear news of peace, even now, even now, and... Um, Another um, another one of these reads, um, it makes mentions of the beacons of Lachish and Azekah, and it says at the end, but we do not see Azekah, implying that it had fallen and that Lachish was the only city left standing, preventing the Babylonians from uh, reaching Jerusalem. Well, 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 let's just quickly take a quick look at the siege ramp there at Lachish, and this is the ramp depicted in the wall panels, the pictures that we saw earlier on the wall panels from the palace of King Sennacherib in Nineveh. This is 
the only known extant Assyrian siege ramp um, anywhere. And there it is at Lachish. So you can see it here. It's been significantly um, uh, interfered with, hasn't it, by those destructive archaeologists. Um, well, back in its day, the base of the ramp was um, maybe in excess of 60 yards wide. I mean, this was a very significant structure. And so there would have been a lot of these um, these uh, uh, sort of railways, not exactly, but uh, as we saw with the wood and the logs built up on the surface in order to provide easy access for uh, these uh, siege ramps. So there is the only known existing Assyrian siege ramp anywhere, and it's at Lachish from uh, almost certainly from the time of Sennacherib's invasion. Standing at the top of this siege ramp, looking down, here's a picture I took of where that Assyrian camp would have been. Well, there's some other sort of structures there now, but that's where they would have been. And uh, what a tremendously well-organized um, group of, uh, uh, group of uh, um, uh, fighting uh, men, these were, that's another picture again, looking in a similar direction down below where that siege ramp was. And um, I've got a little artist's impression of what the siege might have looked like. We need to take that with a little pinch of salt. There are certainly some, uh, uh, some details that are not correct, but you get the sort of idea. You've already got the idea because you've seen the pictures on the wall panels earlier on. Well, I should probably apologize for the next picture, but here's some strange fella, yeah, nearly seven years ago, having the time of his life at Tel Lachish. There he was. You can almost tell how excited I was. Well, there we go. Let's uh, say cheerio to him. And we need to say cheerio to uh, Tel Lachish itself. There it is from a distance. And um, well, what a joy all of that was. Um, yeah, we're about time to wrap things up. We said at the beginning that uh, we'd take a look at Tel Akish, uh, where archaeology met the Bible. And um, we've seen uh, evidence from uh, literary evidence from the Assyrian records of Sennacherib himself. Um, we've seen uh, uh, illustrated um, illustrated uh, records from the walls of his palace without rival. We've seen some archaeological evidence from the tell itself, and we've seen more importantly than all the evidence of the biblical record. I find this whole um, this whole affair absolutely um, incredible, and I'm very pleased that you have been able to join us this evening for our little travel through time and, well, maybe not space, but uh, um, you get the idea. Thank you all so very much for being with us.